Welcome to today's webinar. I am delighted to have you all here. This webinar is designed specifically for food and beverage businesses that are worried because they like a comprehensive, reliable view of all the external risks and hazards affecting their supply chain, including also collaborating suppliers. Today, we will focus on actionable strategies designed to help you identify and monitor emerging risks across your key products and supply chains with a particular focus on materials and uh, purchase finished products. We will explore how automated risk monitoring and assessment can enhance your proactive approach to food safety. Uh, just a few words about the situation that we see today for the food manufacturers. Food manufacturers today are navigating an area marked by, uh, uh, by a lot of frequent food safety incidents, product recalls, and global disruptions. The consequences of these recalls extend well, extend well beyond immediate financial losses impacting consumer trust, brand reputation, and even uh, sustainability, undermining sustainability goals through increased food waste. As food manufacturers, uh, the core challenge you are facing is the lack of a holistic, comprehensive view of potential risks worldwide, that uh, the risk that could disrupt your supply chains, from supplier vulnerabilities to hazards, present in raw materials. So in this session today, we will delve into proactive and practical strategies to enhance risk assessment and mitigation processes, refine and streamline your food safety plans development and adopt a future uh, focused approach to food safety management. We will provide actionable insights and tools designed to help you identify and respond to emerging risks more effectively and more efficiently. So just a few words about the focus on our webinar today. We will focus on the, and uh, we will uh, discuss the key challenges in monitoring and assisting, assessing ingredients that the manufacturers are facing, how they can understand the complexities in common uh, obstacles in uh, evaluating thousands of ingredients for potential risks and maintaining proactive uh, uh, food safety. Uh, the other case that we will uh, present, uh, that we will discuss is, uh, and we will focus very much, is the real world use cases in risk mitigation. Uh, we will explore real use cases uh, from leading food and beverages com uh, companies illustrating how they formulate effective risk mitigation plans. We will also discuss uh, uh, the strategies and we will explore the strategies uh, to conduct full spectrum risk assessment across your supply chain, in the, uh, enabling a thorough view of risk areas while minimizing manual processes and maximizing the efficiency. And of course, at the end of the webinar, we will have a live Q&A session. You can bring your questions for uh, our expert uh, panel and receive personalized ins uh, insights that could enhance your food safety pro protocols and optimize risk management in your operations. So let's start with our uh, expert speakers today. So I'm. Uh, it's my honor and I'm also delighted to have uh, today with me uh, Sarah Mortimer, uh, an expert with uh, vast expertise in food safety technology. Uh, as Sarah will share with us insights on how companies can leverage technology to enhance food safety and meet regulatory uh, requirements. Uh, and we have, we, we have also today with us Dennis Tracy, which is the CEO of the Culture Compass. Uh, he has, uh, a, an, again, extensive experience, an industry expert. Uh, he's an industry expert with more than uh, 45 uh, years experience who will reflect on how companies can put these insights into action in real world settings. So I want to welcome you both and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, 
I would I have a warm up question eh, for for each of you. So, what do you expect from this panel, Sarah? Thanks, Yanis, and and thank you to everyone who's joined and those I know who take the recording and listen later. Uh, thank you for being on. Um, I'm looking forward to a really good discussion on how we can leverage technology tools to enhance our HACCP plans. And I love what Yanis has got behind him. Let's ensure safer food for everyone. Things happen, things go wrong. How can we get ahead of that, learn from others' mistakes and uh, build in more prevention to our HACCP programme? So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for including me. Thank you so much, Sarah. Dennis, welcome. And thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. Yes. What do you expect from this panel? Um, well, can I first uh, echo uh, Sarah's thoughts? It's great to uh, sit on the same platform as Sarah again. It's always a learning experience for me. And um, so my um, thoughts on this, I know I've worked with uh, you guys a couple of times now, and what I find exciting is what new and innovative ideas you can bring to the reduction of risk in my supply chain. So what I'm looking to do is to hear some examples of, of work that you've done and then also add my perspective onto that. And I'm really hoping that we do. And I do recognise a number of the uh, attendees today. So I'm hoping we get some great questions. Uh, I know there are a couple of people in there who uh, who will definitely have some views. So I'm looking forward to uh, ex exploring the ideas, but then also very much to having the debate uh, later, Janice. That's great, and thank you so much for the intro. So let's move on. I will start with the challenges that we see uh, in the industry. Uh, so the modern food and beverages manufacturer landscape is increasingly complex. Uh, I think that we all know that, and uh, no one will disagree on that. With supply chains spanning the globe, food safety and quality teams face the, the challenge of ensuring the food safety and integrity of thousands of products uh, and uh, across diverse categories. The pressure to maintain safety standards uh, is heightened by the frequency of recalls, as I mentioned before, the regulatory demands and the constant emergence of new risks, the emerging risks that we call them. In this environment, manufacturers must adopt robust, proactive strategies to effectively safeguard their brands and protect consumers. So, uh, but really, which are the challenges that we have, uh, we hear from, from the companies? And here, uh, we can take a look at some insights gathers, uh, gathered uh, from our webinar participants who shared their primary needs and challenges when it comes to monitoring and assessing risk and food safety. Interest, it's very interesting that uh, the top two needs, uh, each mentioned by 50% of the participants, uh, highlight a critical focus on continuously risks and hazards that could impact their supply chain. This shows a clear demand for stronger risk assessment methods and more efficient uh, access to real-time data to manage potential threats effectively. Uh, so, uh, in more detail, the challenges in prioritizing these this needs that we hear is, first of all, the unpredictable risks. So, many participants uh, before this webinar expressed concerns over unexpected emerging risks they have not encountered before, especially those arising from global supply chain uh, disruptions and new sourcing regions. Uh, these unforeseen challenges increase the difficulty of maintaining proactive uh, risk management. The second thing that uh, we, we see in the challenges uh, that uh, the uh, experts have shared with us is the lack of comprehensive visibility. A significant challenge is that the experts do not have a holistic, dependable view uh, on, of all the external risks and hazards all the potential hazards uh, that uh, could affect supply chains, including those posed by, uh, by collaborating suppliers. And then another challenge is the outdated and manual processes. 
So we, we hear a lot from the people that we are working with that uh, they are frustrated because still some uh, tasks like the risk monitoring and risk assessment, assessment is done manually. Uh, some processes are outdated and can be updated only once per year. Uh, and this, of course, this approach not only shows uh, not only, sorry, slows slows down the decision making process, but also leaves room for human error, making it very hard to adopt uh, to a rapidly changing uh, risk uh, landscape. So, these responses underscore the urgent need for modernized, streamlined systems that provide a reliable, real time view into supply chain risks. So. Before moving to the, to the specific use cases, Sarah, Dennis, which is your reflection on this on the these industry challenges? I will start with you, Sarah. Thanks, Yanis. Um, you know, I started out more than 40 years ago, and, and um in those days we relied on quite static information sources, ICMSF libraries if we were lucky enough to have access to those and it was very static um there's so much information today um and the global supply chain adds so much complexity to when i was first a quality manager working in hassop so I, I think it's interesting that that those sort of priorities come through um i was a little surprised at how much lower the um filtering out of what's irrelevant came on that list uh I know everything is relevant to some extent, but that to me would be a major challenge today, I think, if I had access to what was going on around the whole globe, 26%, there we go. I thought that was quite interesting um, when you think about having a more dynamic, preventative food safety management system. And I see so often HACCP plans now that are inherited, they're quite static. And that sometimes reflects the fact that the sources of information are also static, whether they're great systems like FDA has a database or elsewhere in the world. But the dynamism that you really want today uh, um, is a big challenge. And as I, I think it's there in the continuously monitor. I think that reflects it. So um, it's it's very interesting to look at these survey results. I appreciate everyone that, that inputted into that. It's not easy. I think we understand that. No, Dennis? No. <laughs> Dennis, what do you think about these challenges? Um, look, I suppose my, my experience, well, I agree with Sarah. You know, when I joined uh, uh, Unilever back in 1979, every factory had its own laboratory. We were testing our own raw materials. There was no coordination. There was no links to anything. Uh, and what we see today is a, is a, is a revolution. And in, in just in terms of our understanding of the environment. So we know an awful lot more now than we did back then. Uh, we still don't know enough because we're still experiencing problems. Has that is that because, you know, consumer demand has driven us to the far reaches of, uh, of uh, our dear planet, you know, where people are not satisfied with what they ate even last year, let alone 20 years ago. So consumer um, trends have driven us to uh, explore novel materials from novel parts of the world. You know, you, you, you see examples there. I'm, I had, you know, 1,500 suppliers uh, around the world. And trying to keep a track on all of that, you know, it's difficult. But the further you extend your supply chain, Janice, the further you stretch your resources. And there has to be a compromise. And where does that compromise go? The other thing I'm, I, I be, became increasingly concerned about towards the end of my formal years in in food supply chains was that audit bodies and retailers uh, began to drive the agenda of what was appropriate to be uh, the focus of internal QA teams so I was increasingly seeing even my own teams I had 36 factories in across 13 countries and even in my own factories my own QA teams uh, QA and food safety teams were becoming distracted by becoming ready for the next audit, whether that was a retailer or a GFSI or even the pest control reports, you know. So they stopped actually thinking for themselves and started waiting for somebody else to tell them what their next non-conformance was or what they needed to do. 
Uh, and that became a little bit of a worry. So we we obviously changed that. So I think there's a huge dynamic environment going on here. And I understand uh, that our ability to understand data and to, to be able to turn that into, into information it becomes increasingly critical as the supply chain extends. Thank you so much, Dennis. This, this is very, very interesting view that you are sharing both. So without any delay, I will go to the industry use cases to see specific use cases of uh, how we could tackle and how we could help in these challenges using and how technology could uh, help in these uh, challenges. So we have here uh, four use cases. I hope that we will manage to discuss them all today. If not, we can share them also after this, uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, so the first use case will be focusing on the actionable alerts for suppliers. How, as we are mentioning, Dennis, having hundreds and hundreds of even more than 1,000 uh, 1, suppliers, how we can monitor all uh, these suppliers, the food safety performance of these suppliers. So this is the first use case uh, that we will uh, describe. And uh, uh, it would be great to have your thoughts on that. The second use case will be about establishing a more dynamic approach for supplier risk assessment, which usually take place uh, and is done annually on an annual basis. Uh, so it, it is quite static. How we can use the data, the global data, and the technology to make this more dynamic. Uh, and then in the third use case, uh, we will share uh, examples of how uh, a system, uh, risk intelligence system like Fudekai could be used to update uh, frequently the uh, HAS plan uh, for specific category of products. And then the last uh, use case will be uh, on uh, emerging risks reports that we can create uh, using the global food safety data uh, and make this data tail, uh, relevant and useful at the hands of the people that are working uh, uh, at the plants, uh, at the facilities, so they can update and they can check that they have a plan and a food safety plan is covering the most important risk and the emerging risks that uh, have been identified. So let's start with the first use case. Uh, this use case is about leveraging real-time alerts to quickly identify and address issues that may impact the supply chain, reducing all the manual monitoring efforts, and ensuring that uh, we can have a timely communication with suppliers. Uh, so let's see which is the case here. Uh, one of our clients, which is a food manufacturer, has, is uh, managing uh, and uh, using more than 1,000 materials and ingredients. Uh, is, uh, it has globally more than uh, over 800 suppliers. Uh, it has 30 plants in Europe, Asia, and North uh, America, uh, and a global uh, food safety and quality assurance team of uh, 25 experts located uh, in Europe, Asia, in each region like Europe, Asia, and North America, which is the pain point uh, that uh, this uh, food manufacturer had, uh, was that he was afraid that they will miss, that the team, the FSQA team, will miss an important risk that can affect their suppliers and materials. So our client has a broad range of products materials and suppliers and the experts that are working, the FSQA experts, uh, was not able to search, or did not have the time to search manually on the web for new food safety and fraud incidents that may affect their supply chain. So the solution that they were looking for uh, was the, that they needed a system that will tell them that from all these 800 suppliers they have, uh, they should focus on those that have food safety issues and activate timely the preventive measures. Uh, so how a system like Fudakai uh, could help uh, and help the specific uh, manufacturer, our client. So the first thing that we, we did in collaboration with our uh, client is to integrate to import all the ingredients suppliers and, reg and the regions 
uh, from which the uh, so the ingredients and materials were uh, sourced to import this information into Fodakai. And the customization was different. And we made the customization to be tailored for the experts that needed to focus specific food categories and hazards. So was not uniform uh, for all, uniform uh, the same, but it was different uh, focusing on specific food categories uh, and hazards. Uh, and uh, after doing this kind of customization, the system using the global food safety data that uh, is collected from all the food safety authorities all around the world, uh, the system is uh, uh, sending email alerts highlighting every time which materials and ingredients may be affected. And the most important thing, uh, the, our client uh, had uh, and he has real-time alerts for uh, all his suppliers to make sure that uh, he will not miss any important risks that may be published for this uh, for one of its uh, of uh, his suppliers so specifically uh, recently he, he had uh, there was an issue a uh, biological issue uh, in one of the herbs that he's using in in the products uh, and uh, this was uh, by a specific supplier uh, that he has in his supply chain so he got this uh, alert and uh, he used this alert to actively to immediately communicate with the supplier to discuss what kind of issue this was exactly, uh, which are the preventive measures that the supplier uh, has for this specific uh, biological issue in his uh, production line and his processing uh, line. Uh, and uh, he also requested uh, an audit uh, to be conducted to make sure that he will avoid and he will prevent any potential incidents because this contaminated uh, material will enter uh, his supply chain. So which is the business value that we saw uh, in this case? The business value for our client was that he saved efforts from manually checking and verifying which of the 800 suppliers may be affected by uh, emerging risks. Uh, these efforts specifically were reduced by over 50%. And this, the, the other very important business value uh, was that uh, he managed, uh, they managed, the FSQA team managed to activate early the preventive measures for specific uh, suppliers, uh, for this specific supplier in the case that I show you to prevent an incident that it is costly and uh, may have negative impact on the brand. Sarah, what do you think about this use case, which is uh, how close it is to what you have seen in the industry? I, I really like this one, Yanis, and it's, it's just what I was talking about, the dynamism of it. Um, Many of us have been involved in incidents, and if you've got a good spec system, you can trawl that spec system, you can ask questions of it, and it will tell you whether any of the ingredients are, are um, in, in, impacted when you hear about an event. So Dennis and I were talking about recently the um, repeat event of peanut holes extending, at this time mustard, before it was cumin. When cumin happened, which was about 10 years or so ago, we had to trawl through the specs looking for anywhere we use cumin. This is much more proactive. If you've got all of your ingredients and materials in a system already, the fact that there's some technology which alerts you, the user, is way better, way better. And I know you're very clear on this isn't the only tool, Yanis, and I appreciate that, but something like this to help us not be slaves to the systems, but you know, really make the system work for us and get in front of, ahead of anything that's going on. So it's exactly what I think that we need. I don't see it very often, I'll be honest, but I think we will hopefully see more and more systems that incorporate such technology or approaches like this. Thank you so much. I could talk longer, but I'll stop. Yeah, yeah. We have, we, have, <laughs> we have some more use cases. So you, 
we can we can also uh, you can also share your thoughts about the other aspects uh, of the risk monitoring and assessment and prevention dennis what what do you think about this use case okay so i'm i've got quite a i'm a quite an opinionated person as i know where uh, nick sharman who's on the, the call will know so any business any food business that waits for something to happen in order that they react to it and safeguard their products and their consumers shouldn't be operating as a food business so my view is very much that when you are first, the first thing you need to do is risk assess your supply chain. So you need to know as much as you can about your raw materials, about your sourcing, about how what 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 the risks are, that whether they're microbiological or, or chemical, physical or or toxins or whatever it may be. And you map that out. Once you've established that, you're then you have a relationship. I, I firmly believe in having relationships with your suppliers. So you you know if you want to take the risk of buying on the open market, uh, you'll do it cheaper, but you open open yourself up to risk. What you should be doing, in my view, is you should be having relationships, long term visions, long term contracts. So if there is a problem, your fifteen hundred suppliers tell you that there's an issue going on, uh, and um, that 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 information comes through in that way. Having said all of that. The biggest risk in any supply chain is change, is vulnerability, is, is, is when things happen that you haven't predicted or things happen that you couldn't have predicted. And that, and I can mean that, that can be everything from a, a weather event to a, a cross contamination in a supplier or to even a, a change of government in a, in a sourcing uh, region. So in that case, that that two or three or five percent additional insight that you can get from a system like this can give you that critical edge when the issue, issue, issue does occur. Uh, what I would look to this system to do is, as Sarah said, brilliantly, I dissect my, my, my understanding of my supply chain and where that basil or that cumin or that material has gone to. I need to be able to do that literally in seconds, not, not days sifting through paper. And then I need that information to enable me to make a decision that takes me two ruddy degrees away from the, the, the torpedo that's heading for my ship. So I can steer just enough to get away from it. So it's this, this insight is critical when you need it to be critical, but I would always emphasize uh, on the, the ability for your information to help me to risk assess my supply chain in the first place and keep me away from these challenges uh, uh, in first place, Giannis. That's, that's very important. And uh, for the, this reason, the second use case that we have uh, is about how we can enable this uh, risk assessment in the supply chain of a company. So again, here we have a company with similar profile, a food manufacturer with sim similar profile. And this specific use case is focusing on how we can leverage real-time food safety incidents data to establish a more dynamic risk assessment for suppliers and efficiently design the preventive measures, like for instance, audits, the, the audits plan or the, the testing plan. So specifically here, the use case in this use case, the pain point that we were discussing with uh, that we identified in in the manufacturer uh, was that they had several incidents and nonconformities, mainly because uh, his foreign suppliers of materials were not able to identify all the potential hazards, and they do not know how to manage these risks for for the ingredients. Uh, here, the example, the specific example had to do with uh, some specific uh, herbs and spices and also cocoa as a material until before using a system that can provide all the data and can enable this uh, uh, more dynamic and automated uh, risk assessment for suppliers, the FSQA team performed uh, supplier assessment once per year using mainly internal information that they have about audit results, certification and non-conformities. Of course, these are very important data and should be used. 
Uh, but it's not enough for the reasons that you are uh, also describing, Sarah and Dennis. So uh, they, they were trying to do that using several spreadsheet files. Uh, and they were also asking their suppliers what kind of measures they have in place for the risk that they have identified uh, using this uh, manual and uh, uh, annual uh, process. Eh? Uh, the foreign suppliers usually, and it was also the case here, they do not have the tools to identify all the emerging risks. This is what we, uh, the, the, our customer realized. So how the Fudakai helped the manufacturer in this case, first of all, as I mentioned in the previous use case, since we are focusing very much here on the supplier assessment, we added all the suppliers and the source ingredients uh, from these suppliers uh, in Fudakai for continuous monitoring of all the emerging risks. And uh, here we can have a list uh, of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dennis, uh, 1,500 uh, suppliers or even more. We have a, a clients with more than 2,000 suppliers. So there's no limitation because this is what the, this kind of technology can bring to you. It does not, uh, the technology can support very large numbers and can do very uh, efficiently this work of manually checking of what is uh, what uh, kind of issues uh, there are out there for the suppliers and the source ingredients from these suppliers. So the, the client managed to identify all the potential hazards for the materials and ingredients uh, for each supplier. And uh, they shared this report. It is possible to create such a report in the system with all the potential uh, hazards for the materials and the ingredients that are used uh, and uh, they shared these reports of hazards with suppliers asking them to provide uh, a food safety plan and uh, a set of measures that covers all these potential hazards uh, and uh, the other thing that they managed to have is on the system they can have uh, a dynamic risk assessment dashboard for all the suppliers using data, uh, not only the ones that they were only already using, but also data for recalls, border rejections, inspections, outbreaks uh, that uh, this supplier, that each supplier was linked to uh, in order to reduce the frequency of audits for low risk suppliers and increase the focus on high risk ones. So this, this is what this kind of dynamic risk assessment approach can enable. And one more thing that was very critical in order to design the preventive measures, the plan, the audits plan or the testing plan was to use for these specific materials, the forecast for the, uh, for the trends of specific hazards from, uh, for materials from specific regions and this is what enabled uh, the proactive communication and what uh, uh, allowed the proactive communication with suppliers to make sure that they have a preventive a, a, a plan, uh, a testing plan, an audit plan that is focusing on and it's including all the uh, risks, all the emerging risks, but also all the known issues that... Uh, uh, we have for these specific materials. And again, here, the business value that uh, uh, we have for this specific uh, client is that uh, he can be sure that all the foreign suppliers will have preventive measures for all the potential hazards by sharing these reports, these hazards reports that I mentioned. Uh, they, he, he is able now to design an efficient audit testing plan that is focusing on the most risky uh, suppliers uh, and uh, less maybe on the, on the ones that are not affected so much by emerging risk. And uh, of course, the eventual goal is to reduce the number of non-conformities and to save costs from the rejected materials and finished products uh, by having a very good risk prevention approach. Sarah, what do you think about this 
dynamic risk approach for risk assessment approach for suppliers? Is this something that it could help also other companies in the industry? Yeah, no, no question. I think uh, when I've been to manufacturing plants and I look at their HACCP plans and particularly the raw material hazard analysis, which often is not very deep, the hazard analysis of raw materials, and you say you really need to do more. People work really hard, in my experience, in the food manufacturing industry, and they look horrified because I might already be working 12 hour days and I'm asking them to do more. That's a 16 hour day, they're thinking. So we have to work differently. We have to. And we have to leverage um, technology insights that we can get from wherever we can that's reliable to enable us to be um, not just more efficient and save time, but actually being much more effective and comprehensive in our hazard analysis. I'm based in the USA, for those of you who don't know, so I'm well familiar with FISMA and what the FDA has been doing. FDA is about to relaunch their training on FISMA, and they are majoring on raw material hazard analysis. Why are they doing that? Because they recognize a gap. And they're asking any of you that are involved with the USA or importing into the US to go much, much deeper in your raw material hazard analysis. They provide guidance. Appendix A is excellent, also revised in January this year, but it's static. We need to use good references like that, but with something dynamic like this or similar tools to really bring um, much more real time hazard analysis into our program so that it's not just once a year update for the auditor, as Dennis alluded to, <laughs> agree with that too. So it's much more day to day, but efficiently done. And I can't think how else the industry can do it, Yanis and Dennis, I just can't. So. I really like this case study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Dennis, what do you think? Okay, so first thing I would say is that I've never been able to employ a, an effective food safety system by uh, by using the threat of uh, cost if we get it wrong. So, you know, using the uh, cost prevention model never, it didn't even get my finance director excited. It's all about trying to deliver reduced cost overall in the business, not, not cost avoidance. So the way I operated, uh, and I think the, the example you've given here meshes perfectly in with that. You know, people rely upon certificates of anal analysis, a delivery and inspection, a, a sample that you take and test and positive release and all that sort of thing. I'm wondering if the, the work that I was doing with my business which was once we'd identified a risk, Janice, and that risk might have been something you could measure, I expected my supplier to provide me with their routine monitoring procedures in their laboratories for their raw materials. So if they're producing something for me, I want to see the pesticide report for the grain they're buying before they've turned it into flour. I want that information sent to me. I want that logged and recorded. So I'm not actually looking at what they've produced for me. I'm looking at the way they operate their material supply chain themselves. So if that in, so that dashboard which you shared is absolutely music to my eyes and ears because it's exactly the way I operated. And if I could have incorporated the insight that you had into my dashboard, so all I can see is what my 1500 suppliers are sharing with me, plus what I'm auditing, plus what I'm testing. If you could share the worldwide perspective on that, then that's going to give me that three to five to six percent more insight than I have with my own systems. Then for me, it could potentially be a game changer, not just in terms of avoiding issues, but in terms of me being able to genuinely save money by reducing the testing that I have in place for my suppliers that do comply with my systems and don't pick up, uh, uh, don't appear on my dashboard as a red uh, to enable me to focus on those other areas, extreme areas where I've got no choice but to sample and test before I put that product into my plant. So that's my insight. 
Thank you both. It's really interesting yeah, what what this uh, such a real time uh, global data can can enable and can enhance the already the practices that uh, uh, we have already in the industry, which are very good, eh? but still in some cases need to be enhanced with more uh, dynamic information. So the I think that we have time for one more use case, and this is uh, about updating. Uh, using real-time hazards analysis and uh, risk assessment to update the hash plan. Uh, here we have a manufacturer with a bit more uh, larger supply chain, more uh, ingredients used in their finished products, uh, more suppliers uh, globally, uh, 20 plants, uh, but a smaller uh, FSQA team. So the challenge is even bigger if you want to update the food safety plants, if you want to make sure that uh, the uh, plants, the facilities are uh, implementing correctly a HASA system. So here the focus is on a specific, uh, a specific category of products like bakery products. Uh, the manufacturer, the main pain point that we were discussing with our client is that they had several incidents because they had physical, biological, and chemical specific hazards uh, in uh, the uh, their supply chain, specific issues. Uh, and one of the things that they realized that they can do is to update uh, the FASA, uh, but uh, every time that there is something, an emerging issue, but it was they were explaining to us that it's time consuming and uh, uh, right now they can only do it every time that something's already happened in a, a more reactive way. So the solution that uh, they needed uh, is a process to update, to set up a process that can update uh, the food safety plan for all the potential hazards. Uh, and they needed a system that can help uh, very much in the identification of potential hazards uh, that uh, can drive the identification of, uh, of course, of critical control points and also how they can decide which are the limits for each critical control point. Uh, so in this case, uh, we collaborated uh, together with uh, the specific manufacturer uh, and uh, we explained and we agreed and we explained to, to, to the FSQA team and we also agreed that a very good way of identifying all the potential hazards is to use uh, the dynamic hazard analysis that a system like Fudakai can provide, which includes all the latest hazards, physical, chemical, biological, that we may have in the supply chain for the specific materials and ingredients that they were using. So this was the first point at which uh, the HACCP planning could be enhanced. The second point is that uh, for each of the uh, identified potential hazards, we have the frequency of uh, the specific hazards uh, identified, reported for this uh, materials and ingredients. So we can determine using this frequency uh, which are the critical control points that we should have. Uh, since the system is also reporting not only the issues, uh, like for instance, that the acephate was, uh, fine, was found in a specific uh, vegetable, but also which is the analytical result of this uh, uh, acephate of these specific pesticides that was uh, the pesticide that was used. So we can use this knowledge and the client can use this knowledge to establish the limits for this specific hazard. And uh, we, we also discussed and uh, uh, we, we set up uh, a very good way of uh, keeping all the records for the HASA planning, like for instance, having all the testing results for the critical control points uh, organized in a dashboard, organized in a system and be able to use the dashboard to see 
uh, how much, how close uh, we are operating uh, to the, how close to the critical limits that we have defined, uh, we have the analytical results for the specific uh, hazards that were identified in the uh, specific uh, supply chain. So these are just some examples of how uh, this data, the data can be used in some of the main steps of the hazard planning, like uh, the ones that I'm presenting here. And we just focus on uh, three, uh, four steps that we can use the global data to enhance uh, the hazard planning. And the obvious values that uh, we discussed and uh, we agreed together with the, with our client that he's getting is that in this way, they can have a dynamic uh, has a plan uh, up that is updated uh, and this allows the prevention of, of incidents which are costly and have a negative impact on the brand. Uh, and uh, my question here to you, Sarah and Dennis, is how often do you see that we have incidents uh, because we are we have we are using outdated information about the potential hazards in the supply chain. Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, Yanis, and and more than we should be, I think, impacted by some of the failures in the industry. And when you're doing your hazard analysis, you're also looking at a risk assessment and likelihood of occurrence is the is the variable. Usually, the impact on health is somewhat um, static, somewhat. Although, you know, obviously medical knowledge changes, but it's the likelihood and we don't adjust that likelihood often enough based on failures that we see in the industry. You've got lettuce here in a bakery, so I'm assuming it's perhaps a sandwich manufacturer or something like that, which is quite risky because you've got a lot of inputs coming in that you're not actually processing or changing during your in, in your own manufacturing plants. You have to manage it further upstream. Um, I hear sometimes people say, well, that happened in a, that happened in a different country, that failure. It, does, it doesn't happen here. We've never had a failure here. Well, to say that, you really have to understand root cause of that failure to know that it isn't going to happen. Why is that risk, that likelihood less in my country or within my supply chain, less than it, it was in the supply chain that it happened? So you really have to dig in. Um, and you have to have that um, trigger to do that, which is coming from these kind of dynamic sources of information. So I, I like all of these three use cases are very interesting and just show the, the need to have that real time input for likelihood of occurrence and risk assessment. Thank you so much. That's a great view. Dennis, what are you thinking? Um... Yeah, I'm not necessarily sure I agree with the whole concept of having a, a HACCP system that, that adapts and changes. So I suppose for me, it was always because of, you know, the difference in capability across 13 countries and 36 manufacturing plants as to understanding what to do on a day to day basis. I, I, we kind of I, I tended to make it quite simple. You know, HACCP is identifying the hazards identifying the com control points and more importantly, the critical control points and putting monitoring in place and absolutely using that monitoring to, to reacting to the process. If you are seeing something coming at you from a different angle or you're seeing a different loading or you've got some specifications uh, uh, that you, you've got raw materials that are not meeting the limits that you've set for the supplier, I wouldn't be touching my limits in my HACCP if that's what the suggestion is. I wouldn't be adjusting my my uh, acceptable or unacceptable thresholds or levels in my HACCP system. I'd be looking at resolving that, as Sarah perfectly put, much further downstream. So I would need a process that would prevent that material from entering my process completely because it hasn't met the limits. So I might put in positive release in place for certain materials. Am I taking materials to a separate area to have that cleaned before it even hits my supply chain? What are the options that I can have at my disposal, but keeping my factories and my factory processes absolutely uh, consistent 
uh, and repeatable because, you know, my philosophy has always been you know, repeatable uh, and predictable. That's what my two favourite words are for supply chains. And that came to me from my commercial colleagues who said, you know, when we said to them, you know, you're launching a new product and, and you're going into a new environment, what do you need from the supply chain? They said, just do the same thing all the time. Don't give us any surprises. So my surprises, I agree with Sarah, the surprises need to be dealt with downstream. So any insight that can help me to do that is always welcome. That's that's a very good view, different, a bit different view of what, what, what I was describing, but very, very important. So as I mentioned, we have one more use case. I will go very quickly through it. The main idea here is how to use the information of the emerging risks and share this information uh, also with the people that are working in the in the plants, uh, with the plant managers and the QA teams there, uh, and do that frequently every month. This is one of the uh, use cases, uh, uh, client use cases that we also have uh, for a food manufacturer that has a similar profile of a long and uh, large uh, supply chain. Uh, so in this case, all the uh, a report with all the merging risks uh, is created monthly and is shared with all the both with the management team, but also with the plant managers at each facility, at each plant. And the main goal is to make sure that the information about the emerging risks is something that goes both to the management at the management level, but also at the production level. So this is the idea. And they are also, in this use case, our customers is also our customer is also attaching the forecasts uh, for specific hazards and regions, uh, so they can also include the forecasted trends of specific issues in specific uh, materials that they can uh, that we can produce that a system like Fudakai can produce using the AI technology. So the, the business value by having this very good knowledge of the emerging risks and sharing this knowledge at all the levels, first of all, they have saved a lot of time uh, uh, from the manual checking and identifying the hazards. Uh, they, they feel that they are doing the best they can in order to prevent incidents because they are always looking about the emerging issues that are out there. Uh, and they also managed to activate early the preventive uh, measures for all, all the, the affected uh, products. Uh, and of course, the goal is to prevent an incident that can be costly and has negative impact on the, on the brand. So this is the last use case uh, quite sim similar with sharing the information about all potential hazard with your collaborating suppliers. But here is about uh, the sharing. This sharing is about uh, the internal, your internal supply chain and how you can make sure that all the people at the different levels have the information of the emerging issues. And this information is relevant for them. So this report is uh, custom for each plant eh, that is using some specific ingredients to make sure that the up, uh, at the upstream, they will identify something, uh, a potential risk that could uh, contaminate the production line. This is, this is the idea. Sarah, a very quick reflection about that, that before going to the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. So another another good case study. I, I wanted to throw in a piece around toxicological hazards because those are ones where we are having to review and adapt our plans. Um, cinnamon in apple sauce and the lead that was found there is a great example where you don't want to bring that in, uh, contaminate across your processes necessarily if you're using something as small as that. So understanding what those limits are what what's coming or an allergen would be another really good one in, for this to, in terms of contaminating your facility 
or if you're a dry clean um, facility and you've got a salmonella issue coming through with a raw material, so many good examples of where you want to get in front of it and prevent that from happening through through having that insight and um, being more dynamic, as we've said all the way through this seminar. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Dennis go because I know we're short on time. OK, thanks. Very, very quickly, strategic materials teams. I've just answered a question from Nick at Sharman. So the way I managed it was obviously communicate to all the plants, but I'm a centralizer, so I don't allow factories to make their own decisions. I know that sounds brutal, but but when I have a problem in the supply chain, I instruct my factories to put a certain material on positive release or not. They don't have that choice themselves. And I operate strategic materials teams, so technical procurement, marketing operations set every month review all of the material groups in groups starches packaging uh cocoa whatever it may be fats and oils and we review that we look at all the information and we instruct factories how to conduct the next four weeks of sampling and testing simple as that control thank you so much so i i i see some questions some very interesting questions uh, that uh, I understand that now that we share the use cases, most of the things have been answered. Like, for instance, how the uh, forecasting, uh, the trends forecasting can help uh, in the preventive, uh, in designing the preventive measures. So this is something that we have uh, discussed already within the, uh, within the use cases. So maybe we have a time for one a couple of questions and then we can answer the rest ones after this uh, session we can provide the answers to the to the participants uh, so sarah i wanted to I, I see a question about which are uh, uh, why do policy makers keep on adding more regulations to cripple the producers so what, what do you think this is a question from the audience why do you think policymakers keep on adding more regulations? You know, I, I smile because it's no different to how we react in industry. We see a failure and we write a procedure and we monitor that we comply with it. Dennis just told us he's doing that for all his factories. Yeah. <laughs> and then we end up with massively complicated systems. Um, I think the intention is very good. When you look at the FDA, that the FISMA was a huge, huge change in legislation and it was much needed and it was long overdue, but it was very thoughtfully done. I think now um, the the FDA, and I can speak for the FDA, is looking at where, which pieces haven't been properly understood, which pieces haven't worked so well, which pieces do we need to enhance the controls on, and the traceability rule is one. It was always there. It hadn't fully been um, published. It, they do seek a lot of input. Um, and the FDA typically allows industry a good amount of time to implement. But it's it's always with positive intent, in my experience. But it's often also very reactive to failure rather than proactive getting ahead of things. FISMA tried, I think. And um, I like FISMA. I like HARPSI preventive control risk-based preventive controls but um i think the governments are no different to how we respond in industry that's my two cents Dennis, what do you think about the same the same issue about the, the adding new regulations and how helpful they are i suppose that you know, you when you identify an issue the you know centralization wh whether it's the fda whether it's me and my qa team my, my health and safety team, whoever it is, whether it's the European Commission, you, you want to help businesses to learn from that. So you put a policy or process in place. Uh, but that that manifests, as I said in my opening statement, into a control process where, you know, uh, um, we lose the ability as a food manufacturing business to risk assess our own raw materials, risk assess our own issues because we're spending so much time complying with you know, I used to say that, uh, you know, if I had three holes in the factory, in my factory roof, I'd fix the one that Tesco saw, not the one that was putting the most water into my factory. So there's an example. You you kind of get distracted by it. But I think you, in order to create safe food, you need regulation, you need control. Uh, you do need auditing, but you also need to 
to, to understand your supply chain and understand your risks. And I think that's where we most often fall down, particularly when a change occurs in that supply chain. Thank you so much. And it, it was really a very interesting discussion. As we, uh, I, I see some uh, in, in the chat, in the Q&A, we could have this discussion for hours and uh, elaborate more our thoughts. But uh, I would like to thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Dennis, for sharing your thoughts and views on how the technology can help uh, the food industry uh, in uh, enabling the risk prevention, in, in changing, switching the reactive approach that, that we have uh, to more proactive approach. Uh, and of course, this is not that can be done by just pushing a button. It's not so easy. Uh, uh, we need to follow the regulations. We need to, to keep very good processes and practices that we have in place. And we need to integrate uh, the system in such a way that can enhance the current uh, approaches. So thank you so much uh, for all uh, of you. Thank you very much for uh, all of you that participated in this uh, webinar. If you want to uh, deep uh, to, 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 to have a deep dive, uh, a dedicated session with us on how uh, the technology can be used uh, uh, in order to have actionable insights uh, and to enable this uh, the risk prevention that uh, through the use cases that we showed you, we are very happy uh, you know, to, to organize a call and to discuss this. So thank you very much. Sarah, Dennis, thank you so much. It was so great to have this discussion and have you with us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Yanis and thank Dennis. You. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Thank you.